The Maryland Addiction Consultation Service is funded by the Behavioral Health Association within the state of Maryland. All of our services are free, and that includes a warm line from 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. And you can call into that warm line with questions as patient specific as you'd like, as long as it is de identified information. And then we will connect you with an appropriate consultant to kind of walk you through the best way to treat that patient. But we also answer questions. Um, uh, broader questions such as dosing or best policies and practices for your practice, and we can help you implement that. And that kind of also goes into our technical assistance service. Our TA service um, does help with creating those policies, and we can set up in-house trainings for your practice. But we also offer trainings like today that are usually during the lunch break, and those can be one-hour webinars, but we also offer waiver trainings. Um, and DAX is a very similar service. The difference is the funding, and it's also in the District of Columbia, so we have different consultants for that. But we do appreciate both audiences being online with us today. We're excited for a great webinar. I am going to introduce our presenter for today. Our presenter for today is Dr. Bethany DePaula, who received her Doctor of Pharmacy degree and completed a Psychiatric Pharmacy Specialty Residency at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. Her research and teaching focuses focus involves psychiatry and substance abuse, and she serves as director of the University of Maryland Psychiatric Pharmacy Residency Program and is a board-certified psychiatric pharmacist with inpatient and outpatient psychiatric and substance abuse practices. In addition, she has worked as the director of the pharmacy at two Maryland State Psychiatric Hospitals, and Dr. The Paula has presented and published research related to psychiatry, substance abuse, and academics, and she is specifically interested in the comorbidity of psychiatry and substance abuse. Dr. De Paula is one of our consultants on the MAC side of things, and we are grateful to have her. Um, this is a talk that she has um, used a couple times in different settings, so she's adapted it for a few. Uh, quite a few audiences, and we always have a great reception. So we are excited for Dr. DePaula's presentation today. So I will now turn it over to you, Dr. DePaula. Thank you very much, Bridget. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. All right, so today we're gonna to be discussing fight fighting stigma in the pharmacy, using the right words to support patients with opioid use disorder. And here's a quick look at our learning objectives. At the end of this presentation, I hope that you'll be able to identify stigmatizing language, determine person-first alternatives, and have an opportunity to propose scenarios within a pharmacy setting where reducing stigma might improve patient outcomes. So I think we're probably all aware of the fact that we're experiencing a really significant opioid crisis that has persisted for decades. And this is a somewhat simplified explanation, so I don't want to say this is the full source of where, how we got to where we are today, but one large factor was in the 1990s, there was a really great initiative to assess and treat pain. And if you're practicing back in the 90s like I was, you might remember the Joint Commission with patient safety goals around assessing pain and pain is a vital sign, etc. So a uh, part of the, I guess, ramification of all of that was prescribing of opioids and over prescribing of opioids. And I have a kind of a neat little slide that shows that as sales, uh, pharmaceutical sales of prescription opioids went up, there's almost a mirror image line of opioid overdose related deaths. And I'm sure you've heard about all the lawsuits with the pharmaceutical companies and into around the, the middle of the first decade, 2003-2005, um, there was a recognition that there was probably over-prescribing and, and inappropriate prescribing of prescription opioids, and there was a good effort to re-educate and really focus on reserving opioids for acute, severe pain and not for chronic pain and not for less severe, and 
reduce the duration of the prescriptions. And so that clearly led to a reduction in both opioid prescribing and prescription-related opioid deaths. Unfortunately, it didn't really resolve the problem. And so by 2010, we see an increase, a decrease in prescription opioid-related deaths, but an increase in heroin-related deaths, and that's because many of the patients who had opioid use disorder and were receiving prescriptions for opioids now look for non-pharmaceutical street sources for opioids, and so we're using heroin. And that quickly changed as the landscape of street drugs really changed. And so you, I'm sure you've heard about fentanyl overdoses and the rise in fentanyl overdoses. And obviously there is prescription fentanyl, but when we talk about fentanyl overdoses, the vast majority of them are related to, again, non-pharmaceutical or street drugs. Basically fentanyl is very cheap and easy to make on the streets, and it's being added to not only the street opioid source like heroin, but other drugs like cocaine. And so we've seen a really uh, a great incidence and in increase in overdose-related deaths related specifically to fentanyl. When you look at the data between 1999 and 2019, nearly half a million people have died from over opioid overdose deaths. If you're wondering how Maryland falls into all of this, our pattern actually as a state looks very similar to what we've been seeing going on on a national level. There are regional differences. Baltimore City has actually had a long-standing issue with heroin use, opioid use disorder, opioid overdose-related deaths, but the state as a whole really mirrors what's been going on throughout the, the country. And this is this data from 2008 to 2021, but you can see that there's been a continued rise in overdose-related deaths with a leveling off around 2019. And in case you were wondering what about the pandemic, pandemic definitely made things worse, and so there's been exponential increases in overdoses since 2020. When we look at the actual incidence of opioid misuse and opioid use disorder, you can see that nine and a half million individuals, 12 and over, misused opioids in the U.S. And this is based on data from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, with the vast majority misusing prescription opioids. 2.7 million met the criteria for opioid use disorder, and probably the most alarming to me is the fact that over 41 million individuals needed substance use treatment, and it's estimated that only 4 million received any substance use treatment. So it's really important to talk about ways in which we can improve treatment and outcome for patients. And that's sort of how we got to today's topic, because stigma certainly affects patient outcomes. Just so we're all on the same page, the National Institute of Drug Abuse defines stigma is di as a discrimination against an identifiable group of people, a place, or a nation. It's basically a label-associated stereotype that elicits a negative response. So in the case of substance use disorder, some of the commonly held stigma include that this patient population is dangerous, they're unpredictable, they can't take care of themselves, and probably the most damaging, that it's their fault. They cause the condition, they can stop at will, and they're just choosing not to. There are various types of stigma that have been defined in the li literature. Public stigma is driven by stereotypes about people with opioid use disorder, which translate into negative attitudes. So basically, again, that this population is dangerous, that it's their fault, that leads to negative attitudes by the public. Anticipated stigma is something that the stigmatized individual experiences. It's basically where they're aware of the negative attitudes and expect to be rejected because of it. So they're aware that opioid use disorder is not seen positively by the public and expect people to react. Internalized or self-stigma is where the person with the stigmatized identity not only is aware of that stigmatized identity, but they actually accept it 
as as valid. So they also sort of see themselves as it's their fault and they deserve blame. Courtesy stigma is a type of stigma that family members and friends experience, and it's a result of the affiliation with people with opioid use disorder. And then there are several different types of societal stigma. So there's enacted stigma, and this is the behavioral manifestations of public stigma. It's where, again, because of those negative attitudes and and I guess uh, stigmatizing thoughts about this patient population, it leads to manifestations like discrimination, like social distancing, and can lead to suboptimal care, affects access to treatment, harm reduction strategies. Then there's structural stigma, and this is on an even larger scale. It's the way in which society constrains those with stigmatized identities. So it's the war on drugs. Again, attitude that this, this patient population is dangerous and need to be punished, and so we're going to throw them in jail. The bottom line is that all of these stigmas, types of stigma, are interrelated. They're reinforcing. Hopefully, I've sort of showed that with some of the examples, and they result in poorer health outcomes for patients with opioid use disorder. Why are patients with substance use disorder stigmatized? And we've had some progress when we look at mental illness and efforts to remove stigma around mental illness, particularly with mood disorders like depression and anxiety disorders. There's been some change in attitudes. One of the ones that I like to think about a lot is, I know the Royals are in the news and not a lot right now, um, but they've been in the news obviously for a while, and Prince Harry in particular was quite well known for talking about the struggles that he's had growing up with depression and anxiety after the loss of his mother and has really supported some of the, the programs that support mental health and awareness. And there are other public figures in the U.S. that have also talked about their struggles and how they've addressed them. So it's something that, that is being discussed. And in fact, this picture off to the side is me. From several years ago, I went to a psychiatric pharmacist conference that we have every year. And that year, the theme was stigma free and so we were pledging to be stigma free and taking our signing the sign and taking our pictures in front of the sign and then it was something that you could share on social media so lots of examples in which there have been to to try to address stigma the issue is that substance use disorder related stigma in particular really persists. And this probably stems from the belief that addiction is a moral failing. Again, it's the, the person's fault. And compared to other psychiatric disorders, patients with substance use disorders are mo more often blamed. We know that the media perpetuates this. I have a, an article about psychiatry in the media, and one of the lead summary statements is, if it bleeds, it leads. And, and that's a good point about headlines, headlines that are shocking, headlines that are violent. Or, or scary are often the ones that really sell the news. And so you can see, I've just pulled a couple of headlines in 2020 about substance use disorders. A parent junkies turn stretch in New York City's midtown into a shooting gallery. Addicts at high risk of contracting the coronavirus. To some, Maddie was just a junkie. Obituary gives new take on drug addiction. So you can see where that perpetuation of fear and violence occurs in these headlines. But what about healthcare professionals? So we know stigma is high among the public, but where do healthcare professionals fall? And so these are two studies that were conducted with physicians. The first was published in 2017, and it's a survey of family practice, internal medicine, and pediatricians. And I've just pulled out a couple of the survey statements, which I thought were really relevant. So the first come from a, a social distance scale type questions. And the first is people addicted to prescription pain medication are more dangerous than the general public. So again, that, that stigma around danger, and you can see that 66% over 66% of the respondents endorsed this statement. 
Landlords should be allowed to deny housing to a person addicted to prescription pain medication, and almost 38% endorse that particular statement, so that desire for social distance. And then when you look at effectiveness of treatment, most people addicted to prescription pain medication can, with treatment, get well and return to productive lives. And about two-thirds endorse this, which is great, but I would like to see that a lot closer to 100% when we're talking about evidence-based medications. Similarly, effective treatment options are available to help people who are addicted to prescription pain medications, about 58% endorsed. And then a second study published in 2020, similar survey group, and unfortunately, similar results. Treatment of OUD is more effective with medication than without, again, about two-thirds endorsed. People can safely use medication in the long term to help manage their opioid use disorder about 63%. What about pharmacy? Where does pharmacy fall in this? And so there have been a couple of studies that have looked at uh, stigma within the pharmacy. And so the first that I'm going to talk about is a survey of pharmacists where they were looking at, again, social distancing scores. And they found that more than 59% or 187 of the pharmacists they surveyed, while they were comfortable performing pharmacy tasks, they had high social distance scores. And that indicates a lack of willingness to interact with a patient with opioid misuse. And it basically means that the respondents are not comfortable forming therapeutic relationships, which can be really important from a patient care and a patient outcome perspective. Another study looked specifically, well, looked at various aspects, but one of the points they looked at was availability of medication, particularly buprenorphine. And this was a study that was conducted in pharmacies surveyed in counties with high overdose rates. And it found that 20% of pharmacies, 183 out of the 921 surveyed, stated that they would not dispense buprenorphine. Not that it just wasn't available, but that they wouldn't dispense it. What about other areas of treatment for individuals with substance use disorders? This first statement is actually a quote that came from an article in the New York Times where the reporter was interviewing various substance use disorder treatment programs as well as 12-step programs. And basically, she states that most programs view medication as a crutch for short-term use and provide only talk therapies. This widespread rejection of proven addiction medication is the single biggest obstacle to ending the overdose epidemic, which is an interesting point. And then this next study is a little bit older. It was published in 2010, but it's really important when we talk about solutions, and it's definitely a study that's often mentioned in the literature with stigma. It was completed by Kelly and colleagues, and it was completed at a mental health care addiction conference. So it was professionals attending this conference and they gave vignettes to 516 providers. And the vignette either used the terminology substance abuser or substance use disorder. And what they found was the term abuser was specifically associated with a greater perception of blame and deserving of punishment compared with substance use disorders. So what are the negative effects of stigma in opioid use disorder? First of all, it can clearly cause social isolation. This is that anticipated stigma. So individuals expect to be rejected, and so they don't want to share that they have a history of opioid use disorder and that they may be actively using substances and so or misusing substances. And so they end up using in solitary situations. And we know very clearly that when an individual experiences an opioid overdose, that overdose is generally administered in the community by bystanders with naloxone. And so if an individual is using by themselves and nobody else knows that they're misusing opioids, then they're at risk for significant morbidity and mortality. 
It also really affects overall support. It leads to family and public desire for social distancing. And again, that's that enacted stigma. It can reduce willingness to seek and engage in treatment. There have been numerous surveys of patients with opioid use disorder or other substance use disorders that specifically cite that they felt stigmatized when they sought treatment and that affected whether they were going to continue in treatment. And it even affects the type of treatment they seek. For instance, there's a lot of stigma around methadone and methadone may be the evidence-based treatment of choice for a specific individual, but they may specifically choose not to be treated with methadone because of the, the negative prevailing attitudes about this medication. It could certainly infect influence providers' perception, which impacts care. So there have been reports in the emergency room where patients have gone to the emergency room, maybe are experiencing acute infection or trauma, but they also have a history of, of opioid use disorder, and they're labeled as drug-seeking, and they don't receive the same level of care that they would without that history. It can serve as a barrier in using evidence-based medications. There may be providers that choose not to become data wavered or to only prescribe buprenorphine to a very limited number of patients. And we actually have a lot of data that supports that most providers who are data wavered don't prescribe at the level that they can based on, on the approved numbers. And it can make individuals reluctant to routinely have uh, naloxone or other harm reduction strategies available. And I, I taught for the overdose response program at one of the local health departments for several years. And we taught the community, but we also taught employees of the health department. And so I'd have security guards, sometimes I'd have police officers attend the training, and I'd often hear this philosophy that naloxone, when it was available to the public, increased the desire for individuals to want to misuse opioids because they knew they could be saved by naloxone. And there's actually no data to support that. The data suggests that in communities where naloxone is readily available, there's actually a reduction in morbidity and mortality associated with overdose, but not an increase in opioid use disorder. And then it can stigma can certainly affect pharmacies and, and pharmacists' reluctance to stock and dispense medications like buprenorphine for opioid use disorder or naloxone. And this is really problematic because there's clear literature that suggests that early access to treatment is very important and that when an individual presents to the pharmacy with a prescription it, for buprenorphine or for other medications for treatment of opioid use disorder, if they aren't able to obtain that at the pharmacy and they have to switch pharmacies, there's increased risk for gap in therapy. And in the case of patients with opioid use disorder, that's increased risk for potentially relapse, overdose-related deaths. So very important that patients have access to evidence-based medicine. Other effects that we can see is the, include that, obviously, the media representation adds to that public stigma, instilling fear towards patients or people with opioid use disorder. It clearly contributes to the underinvestment in the addiction treatment infrastructure. It results in discrimination in benefits, employment, housing. I pulled out some of those social distance scale questions around housing and and discrimination or stigma around housing for patients with opioid use disorder as, as evidence. But there's been some studies that have been conducted. The first is a little bit older. It was published in 2017, and it looked at parity legislation. So there's been legislation that basically requires that insurance cover the treatment of substance use disorders as they would cover other medical conditions, including medications. And yet this survey found that greater than 50 
50% of states that offered Affordable Care Act plans in 2017 did not comply with coverage of substance use disorder benefits. And then another study that's a little bit newer that was published in 2020 interviewed substance use disorder treatment providers about coverage for methadone, residential, and IOP or intensive outpatient programs. And what they found was that the coverage really varied from state to state and no one state provided all ASAM levels of care. So there continued to be those discrepancies. And then stigma clearly shapes public opinion favoring that war on drugs, punitive versus health-oriented management. And this means that people are incarcerated and then they don't necessarily receive appropriate treatment either during incarceration or upon release for opioid use disorder. So what as healthcare professionals can we do? And I'm preaching to the choir a little bit. You're taking the right first step or maybe many steps. And so awareness of stigma and available resources is really important as healthcare professionals in trying to address stigma. We need to be patient-centered, and this means using person-first and recovery-oriented language and being familiar with stereotypes and slang. We want to listen without judgment. We want to treat everyone with dignity and respect, which can be very important. And we need to humanize the experience of people with opioid use disorder. That has been shown to help move the needle with stigma. Opioid use disorder is a chronic relapsing brain disease, and as such, we want to use appropriate medical language both with patients and with colleagues, and understand that susceptibility is affected by a host of factors, but it's not the person's fault. It's outside of their control. We want to assess patient using objective criteria like the criteria in the DSM, which has a chapter on substance use disorders and criteria for opioid use disorder, as well as specifiers that are specific with severity, mild, moderate, and severe. There's defined criteria for those specifiers. Obviously, prescribing and dispensing evidence-based medications is important, and specifically identifying local treatment programs to support all aspects of evidence-based treatment. It's problematic if a patient is being treated with buprenorphine, but then they're referred to another program that is not going to be supportive of treatment. So we all need to be on the same page on the evidence-based plan for any one patient. And then we need to understand that the duration of treatment is going to be patient-specific, that there's no single duration or limit. And when I was at the health department, we had a transfer of numerous patients from the community who had been started in what was a buprenorphine program, but the program was really a long-term detox. Patients were only going to be treated with the buprenorphine for six months to a year, and then everyone had to be tapered off. And we now know that the duration of treatment is really going to be based on the specific patient, and there are patients like with other chronic diseases that are going to require long-term or maybe even lifelong evidence-based medication. We want to use a universal approach, so approaching everyone the same way with, for instance, offering naloxone, offering naloxone to anybody who's filling a prescription for an opioid, any patient with a history of substance use disorders, particularly when we consider fentanyl could be mixed into all different types of, of non-pharmaceutical street drugs. And then we want to emphasize that patients with opioid use disorder respond to treatment and can lead productive lives, but it can take time. So I would mentioned person-first language. What is person-first language? And NIDA has a nice definition. It maintains the integrity of the individual as a whole human being by removing language that equates a person to their condition or has negative connotations. It's a neutral tone. It distinguishes the person from his or her diagnosis. So terms like abuser, addict, junkie, alcoholic 
are all stigmatizing terminology. And we're going to want to replace those with person first language. We want to show that the person has a medical problem, not that they are the problem. And we want to avoid any sort of negative associations or punitive attitudes. So, uh, Good alternatives would be a person with opioid use disorder, a person with addiction, a patient, a person in recovery. Similarly habit, and it's funny because I just saw a PSA commercial and the person in the commercial was talking about their drug habit. Habit really implies a choice. It undermines the severity of the disease. And so good alternatives would be substance use disorder or again, addiction. Abuse. Abuse is another term that we want to avoid because as that study from Kelly and colleagues suggests, abuse is associated with negative judgment or punishment. So in the case of illicit drugs, it would be use, not drug, not abuse, not drug abuse. And similarly with prescription medications, it would be misuse of the prescription medication. Clean and dirty are terms that you hear both when we're talking about toxicology screens as well as individuals. So they had a dirty drug screen or a clean drug screen. And again, we really want to emphasize terminology that's consistent with a medical disorder. So it's not a dirty or clean screen. Instead, it's going to be negative for opioids and positive for specifically buprenorphine or whatever is negative and positive. With people, people are not clean or dirty. They're in remission, they're abstinent from drugs, or they're a person who uses drugs. Treatment. So this is an area where um, I I have used many of these terms that I'm about to talk about. The first is methadone clinic. So methadone clinic is often used synonymously with opioid treatment program. However, a couple of things. A, a SAMHSA waivered or licensed opioid treatment program is where patients can receive methadone for the treatment of opioid use disorder, but it's not the only medication that is provided in an opioid treatment program. And we know that the term methadone clinic by itself can be stigmatizing. So OTP is going to be our preferred terminology. Back when I did lectures, several years ago, it was common and it was included even in the textbook to talk about opioid substitution therapy or opioid replacement therapy. We try to stay away from this type of terminology now because it suggests you're substituting one drug for another and that is not the case. We are using evidence-based medication to treat and as such the type of terminology that would represent methadone or buprenorphine, might be opioid agonist therapy or evidence-based medications or just plain pharmacotherapy. And then finally, MAT. We hear MAT used a lot and MAT often refers to medication-assisted treatment. It, it's in the literature, it's in our legislation, but the assisted treatment component really undervalues the role of medication and makes it unlike other medication, other medical disorders. So preferred term Terminology would be medication to treat or pharmacotherapy for opioid use disorder, or some people have still used the acronym MAT, but have replaced it with medication for addiction treatment. So resources, uh, and this will just be a reference for you. The first reference or the first website is from the Maryland Department of Health. It's really focused for patients. It's got a great handout which summarizes some of the words matters that I just went over and also has some P PSAs. And then for healthcare providers, there's PCSS, there's NIDA. They both have both CE programs around stigma as well as some videos. And then I want to talk a little bit about Max. And I think I can move through this pretty quickly because Bridget also gave us a nice introduction to what Max is. But we are a combination of a consultation service as well as offering training. These services are free. They're geared around providing information related to substance use disorder and chronic pain management. And this is the, the list of the team. You can see it's very interprofessional and includes pharmacists like myself. So if you want to call in or you want to request programming around pharmacy. But again, there's a host of other professionals involved. 
And then if you do call into the consultation services, your call will be answered. Now, these questions should be, the, the callers are professionals. So it's pharmacists, technicians, anyone who is working with this patient population, but it's not for patients to call in. And basically when you call in, your call is gonna be answered by a behavioral health consultant. It'll be referred to an addiction specialist, including potentially myself as a pharmacist. And so you'll talk with the individual and then you'll get a written summary and resources within 24 hours. These are some examples of, of specifically pharmacy-related calls that we might get. So issues addressing buprenorphine ordering and dispensing, selecting various manufacturers or, or formulations of buprenorphine, understanding evidence-based dosing, pain medica medication questions for patients with history of substance use disorder, harm reduction questions around, say, naloxone or syringe sales, tackling access issues, but it's really the sky's the limit. Any kind of questions that you might have, patient-related or practice-related, you can call in. Again, de-identified de as far as patients go. We also offer these type of trainings, which are, are catered to the audience. And then we have ECHO. So ECHO, and the background for my presentation today plugs ECHO a little bit. Um, ECHO is an opportunity for case-based discussion. Uh, you will receive continuing education credit. We meet once a month. We have three different ECHOs. One of the ECHOs is centered around primary care. One is centered around OTP. And one is centered around moms, pregnant women with substance use disorders. And it's all teach, all learn. People bring cases and we discuss them as well as a, a short didactic presentation. So if that's something you're interested in, it's a really great way to learn. And now I wanna take an opportunity to play a video. This video is an example of humanizing the experience of an individual with substance use disorders. And it was created actually by one of our consultants who works at Hopkins and is both a Max consultant and participates in the ECHO. So Bridget, I'm gonna leave it up to you to play the video. I tried heroin not only the first time I tried heroin not only did I like it I loved it and it just gave me a sense of peace that I didn't have to worry about stuff anymore I just wanted to be free of worrying about stuff all the time you know I was a correctional officer at the Maryland Penn and that's when my disease started it's a, a stressful place and a lot of the correctional officers there used. I wasn't even thinking normal. I had to use because I got to go to work. And I realized that I was sick. My mother was an open person, so she told the family, you know, Joy is sick, so we have to support her. Now I realize the, the stress I put them under for them to see me that way. But when you're caught up in a disease, you can't see nothing but your pain. I, don't, I didn't want anybody to look down on me. I didn't want to disgrace my family. So I just faked it. Long, I figured as long as I looked good, and I went to work every day, and I wasn't, so I thought, I wasn't hurting anybody. That's what I thought. The people I admired the most, and still do today, is my mother and my grandmother. You know, my grandmother was the wisest person I ever met. My mother was the strongest person I ever met. I was raised with my great-grandmother, my grandmother, and my mother. I got to run from person to person, getting love and everybody telling me I'm wonderful. We lived around a lot of woods and unexplored areas. I love going in the woods and finding new things to do. I had a German Shepherd. She used to come in the woods with me. I felt safe because she wasn't going to let anything happen to me. I was um, lost in the disease of active addiction for 30 years. 
I saw me. It broke my heart. I saw me. And it was the most traumatic thing that I've ever seen in my life. And I cried out to God, please. So my cry led me to a phone call. And uh, my life just started tra changing drastically. We work really hard to uh, take away aspects of addiction that prevent proper treatment. So we do work really hard to take away shame. We often uh, fail to realize how much social circumstance impacts how people take care of themselves or how they address their health care. So it's putting together a team of people who are, uh, have insight into the fact that, th that when we take care of patients, we have to address all aspects and especially their social setting. Now I'm a peer recovery coach at Hopkins Bayview. So I see people sick just like, I remember when um, sometimes, most of the time, the pain fills the room. I talk to them, I inspire, you know, and try to encourage, and let them know where I come from, let them know it's possible. And the young people, I try to let them know that you don't have to waste 30 years. You can, you can do it now. Peer recovery coach can see, can see someone in the emergency room, and then if that person gets admitted to the hospital, the same peer recovery coach goes up to see them wherever they are, and this uh, fear and anxiety of being admitted in the hospital, and all of a sudden there's a familiar face of someone who I met in the emergency room, someone who knows about my addiction and, and is non-judgmental and understanding. I say I'm free all the time from the disease of addiction because I'm, I'm, I'm free to choose. I didn't have a choice when I was using and I'm free to make my dreams come true. See, I'm, I'm truly free today. You know, I'm, I'm free to love, because now I'm learning how to do it, because I didn't know how to before. So, I mean, it's not the sky's the limit, the sky and beyond. Can you still hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Great, thank you. That was, that was great that you were able to play that. And that's a good example of how sh humanizing and sharing the experience can help to reduce stigma. So we wanted to move into breakout rooms and have a short discussion around some aspects of stigma. So Britain, just a very simple mix of probably what many of you have seen somewhere, whether it be in a, in a community pharmacy or just in everyday life or practice. But in this scenario, you're in a community pharmacy and you hear the following discussion. He's a drug addict with a long history of abuse who just came by to pick up his Suboxone. Substituting one drug for another isn't going to get him clean. So what we're going to do for the next five minutes or so is we're going to break out into breakout groups and we're going to talk about what stood out as stigmatizing, have you had a similar experience, and what can you do in this scenario to combat stigma. So when I say we, that's the royal we. You all are each going to go into individual breakout rooms and then we're going to come back together and talk about this as a group. Please make sure that you accept entering your breakout room. Uh, you were already assigned a breakout room, so you should be able to join. Can you force the people that are stuck out in 
where they just have to select it? They should be forced to select. Yeah. I guess let us know in the chat if you're having problems entering the breakout room. So they have a clock. You said they have a clock when they enter. Yeah. Okay, they can see. And that countdown is at two minutes now. Um, I can automatically force it closed if we have to. Meaning they only have two minutes left? Yeah. Can we give them a little more time? Yeah. Okay. Because it seems like people are still <laughs> migrating. And I have on my, it's 1247, so I would say if you could give them three or four minutes, that would still give us nine minutes or so to discuss and answer questions. What do you think, Bethany, about one more minute? Yeah, I think one more minute. Okay. And then you can drag people back. <laughs> okay. And then I'll need to share again to pull the slide up that we're okay. discussing, correct? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'll give you presenter privileges right now, so you should just be able to pull those up easily again. Okay. And you don't you don't have to do it just yet, but whenever you're ready, please feel free. Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and end it. Okay. 
and I'll I'll share and get my And it's allowing about one minute for people to join on their own and then it'll automatically shut it down. Okay. Can do you see my slide again? My uh it says discussion. Um, I'm not seeing it. Okay. Um cancel. Hold on a second. How about now? There we go. That's great. Okay. I guess you let me know because, again, I in this mood, I can't really see people. So let me know when we're back and ready to discuss. Okay, everyone should be back on here now. All the breakout rooms have officially ended. Okay, great. Hopefully everyone had at least a few minutes to chat on this, and I'm wondering if one or two people would be brave, and obviously no right or wrong answers here. Um, un unmute yourself and talk about what stood out as stigmatizing and if you've had an experience like this and what do you suggest we do about it? I, I don't mind talking in regards to this. I'm a fellow pharmacist. Um, and so I think the whole um, discussion, um, being in a community setting, um, the whole conversation that they are having, whether it be in front of the patient or um, as they're leaving, I think, is all stigmatizing. Um, I think labeling them as clean um, or getting clean, talking about there's judgment and substituting one drug to the next and then labeling them as a drug addict. Um, I think, you know, s someone in management, I would pull one of my employees aside uh, as an opportunity to kind of re-educate them on how they are need needing to be welcoming and less judgmental in regard to this, because that judgment can potentially deter a individual from getting the treatment or help that they are needing. That's all really great points. And yeah, I mean, I think you picked out a lot of the the stigmatizing languages that is this an experience that you've seen happen in the community pharmacy it doesn't have to be these exact words, but either these type of discussions happening patient to patient, patient to staff, staff to staff? Um, I, I will say yes. Um, I is a hu I'm a huge component of kind of um, being that liaison as pharmacists are um, of connecting patients. So one of my things that I tried doing in my particular site was um, for those that were um, identified as um, users in a sense um, when they were coming in to fill certain medications is opportunity for us to engage in conversations with them um, versus um, you know to for some there's some uncomfortability with um, having those crucial conversations but us as pharmacists need to be those vital members to really connect them or keep them engaged into um, healthcare. So kind of overcoming some of what we had talked about with that one survey where you're trying to develop that therapeutic relationship and not using the history of substance use disorder to stand in the way of great patient rapport and outcomes, which is uh, the, the pharmacy is such an important access point for patients with substance use disorders as far as treatment goes. And there's a lot of initiatives to really expand. And so it's really important that we address stigma. So that's great. How about others? Would somebody else like to share? Just it doesn't have to have been in a pharmacy. I mean, I, I can give you experiences that I've had around this that have just been with other healthcare professionals. Anybody else want to add anything? Dr. DePaula. Oh, go ahead. Okay. okay. I, as a pharmacist, uh, have something else to add. 
especially with control meds. A lot of time patients from ER, when they go to like chain pharmacies, pharmacies just tell them outright, no, we don't have the medications. I might mean, just said somebody yesterday who had a C-section, he called around like 10 pharmacies, five went to you know, send his her family members to a couple of pharmacies without even meeting the patient, without even checking the prescription. They're always stigmatized. I mean, nobody, um, when they come to us, we tell them, okay, if you are an ER patient, just walk, come in. I, I don't need, you know, 10, 15 pills. It's not a big deal. I can help you out with that. So it's it's very widespread in, in you know, in our community. Access is a big issue. And again, I gave some example from the literature about not stocking buprenorphine. And I know from talking to pharmacies, um, it, it is a difficult road, I think, for pharmacists because they do want to prevent diversion, but not to the point where we affect patient care. And so um, I have talked to a lot of pharmacies that won't tell patients over the phone what they have in stock because they're concerned about that. And so these sort of access issues are, are really critical right now, and stigma definitely plays a, a big role in that. Um, so I agree, it, it is something. And I think that these type of discussions, and again, we're preaching to the choir probably with some of the people that are attending today, but some of these discussions about how care affects patient and lack of access to care affects patient outcomes are really important because I think ultimately all of us as healthcare professionals really want to do the best we can for patients. So valuable point that you just made. Um, just because we're kind of getting short on time, I want to give you a couple of, of just suggestions that I have and then maybe I have time for one or two questions. But modeling person first centered language and empathy is really important and I think that was kind of already said so in I, I've had this situation where I've just been in a um, like in a round setting and somebody language is stigmatizing and not medically appropriate and so being able to model that person person first centered language and being empathetic but at the same time not making the person that you're talking to uncomfortable in any way can go a long way you certainly don't want to be attacking of that individual and then again emphasizing the chronic disease model and the importance of ed evidence based medication as well as access to that because treatments of effective, but not if you can't get it. Um, and when patients do receive treatment, they go on to live productive lives. And another aspect of all of this is sharing resources. So resources that Max might have that we can share with you. If you go to some of those websites, um, there's both resources for patients, so the, the handouts based on some of the, the language that I presented earlier can be given to patients, can be given to family, can be given to the healthcare team. So there's a good way to, to share. Um, and I guess I only have a minute or two left, but Bridget, do you want me to, to answer a question before we end up? Is there Are there any questions? Yeah, we actually got a couple of great ones from the breakout session. Um, and those are, what other language has been created to describe stigma? Does discrimination mean stigma and do you have any suggestions about what to do in the moment that it happens? Good question. So um, it's stigma and discrimination are, are parallel. They, they, they go hand in hand, but I don't think they're exactly the same thing. Um, sometimes the motivations are similar. Sometimes they're a little bit different. Um, as far as um, what can we really do to address um, as far as in the moment? I think that was some of what we were just talking about. So again, I find you want when you work with somebody and you're in this situation, you want to educate, but you want to keep rapport with that person. And so coming at it from an educational, from even a non-judgmental perspective when you're talking about stigma can make a big difference. I, I went to a presentation and they were talking about pausing the conversation, maybe coming back with a question first, 
before you share and model some of that appropriate language is sometimes an effective way to address, but it is really hard um, on, on how to address and particularly how to turn, how to move the needle as far as individuals' attitudes go. Do we have any other questions, Bridget? I think that's it. We do encourage you to call our line or reach out to us via email. We're happy to connect you to Dr. DePaula or any of our other consultants, if they are, depending on what your question is. As Dr. DePaula mentioned, Dr. Fingerhood spoke at the end of that video. Dr. Fingerhood is another consultant. And actually, Dr. Fingerhood and Dr. DePaula are on our echoes together. Um, so we do encourage you to sign up for those as well, and we'll include more information about that in the follow-up email. Um, but please, and I'll, I'll throw in that that's a free YouTube video. So if there's some, if you want to share that type of experience with other colleagues or even refer patients, uh, it's it's free on YouTube, and you have the link in the slides. Exactly. Yep. And I'll make sure to um, highlight that in the follow-up emails. But please look out for the slides. You'll receive those today. You'll also receive a link to the evaluation survey. Please just allow one to do one to two business days to receive your um, credit certificate. And if you are a pharmacist, your information will be sent um, to the appropriate people. So that's reflected in your portal. Um, thank you all for attending. Dr. DePaula, thank you for your time. This is always a great webinar. We really appreciate it. But thanks all for logging on today. Thank you. And Dr. DePaula, I'll keep you posted if we do get any questions, even just via email, and we'll connect. Sure, we can you. circle back. How many did we have today? Um, at one point, we were in the 70s, wow. so it was a decent group. Excellent. Dr. DePaula, it's Rachel. I saw um, a, high, a high of 81. Yay! That's great. Yep. Thank you so much. This was great. Very well received from everyone. Great. Glad to hear. And it looked like we had a good mix, too, of background, et cetera. But I was happy to um, see some pharmacists on. Yeah, that's great. Yay. Thank you. All right. Everyone have a great day. Talk to you later. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.